real privilege to be here this morning and to be sharing. I'm reading from uh, the book of John, uh, chapter 17, and uh, verse 22, but you will need your Bible. The scripture says, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. There's something profound and significant in this word glory. I mean, glory operates best within the context of unity. And of course, as you see the church growing, because I believe that Pastor Colin <clears throat> has laid some great foundations for you, as you see the church growing, understand that that growth continues within the context of unity within the body, a people walking as one. And now, I want to share a few things about this glory that Jesus has released upon his church. Now, have a look at your neighbor. You might look at your neighbor and think, I don't see much glory there. Um, or you might look at your neighbor and think, wow, they just shine for Jesus. I don't know what it is you see. But whatever you see, uh, and however you see it, perhaps you need the Lord to open your eyes that you might see right. We all know young men and young women who look at themselves in the mirror and think they're ugly. And we're thinking, I wish I was that young and good looking. You know, I remember what that was like. But when they see themselves, they perhaps need to be encouraged because they're not seeing themselves right. So too, when it comes to the church, sometimes we look at ourselves and we apply labels to the church that are not fitting because we don't see the church. We don't see her for who she truly is. This beautiful bride of Christ. This amazing looking uh, church. And of course, when you look at Cavage and Baptist Church, what do you see? You see something made in the image of the Son. You see something being transformed into the image and likeness of Jesus. One of the things we do in our leadership team, we always do because we know that we're flawed as individuals. Anybody here perfect? So we know we're flawed as individuals, and so whenever we start our leadership team meetings, we always start with the question, what have we seen God do? What has God been doing in the community? Because it's only so easy for us to follow the pattern of the world. Let's start with all the bad news. I mean, if you, if you, if you put on your television and you watch the news, I mean, they, they try and have something nice and fluffy at the end of it. They kind of think we're all human beings as well. We, we have feelings. But, but the news is driven by the horrors that happen in the world. And of course, when it comes to the church, no, no, we don't start with how horrible we are. We start with how great God is. We start with, from a platform of looking at the divine and seeing the right what he's doing in our midst. We start with testimony of his goodness before we ever talk about our failures and before we ever talk about our disappointments. We remind ourselves about what he has done. I mean, you always get, you know, the negative individual who always wants to go Eeyore, you know, you know, you know, you know Eeyore, don't you know who Eeyore is? Isn't it? You know, and it's kind of like, um, oh, it's, it's going to rain, you know. And then, and then it rains, and it's kind of, I knew it was going to rain, you know. And, and it's kind of like, I, I don't know about you, I love the rain. I love walking in the rain. I, when it rains, I think this is lovely. I don't like it so much when it's cold and raining. But I loved it, and I find it refreshing. And, but somebody else has a perspective which seems to be it's a horrible or negative thing. And so the glory works best in unity. And what are we talking about? Well, Hebrew, the word kabod, um, the, the Hebrew word for, for glory, really is derived from a word which means to be heavy, prodigious, to, to that which weighs you down, that which is so heavy it rests upon you. And in the context of what the scripture tries to reveal to us, Jesus speaking very clearly here, I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. Now, now think about this for a minute. I, I just want to touch just for a few minutes on what this glory that he's speaking about is. In the Old Testament, we see the glory of God manifest in light, illumination. And of course, we see that light in the form of a pillar of fire uh, by night, cloud by day. 
Isaiah 60 says this, the sun will no longer be your light by day, nor will the brightness of the moon shine on you. For the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. In, in other words, however brilliant the sun is, when you catch a glimpse of who God is, when you see him for who he truly is, he's brighter than a thousand suns. And, and the manifestation of that presence, when God reveals himself, it's, it, it can be incredibly comforting as when he is a wall of fire around Jerusalem or incredibly terrifying when it, when it reveals aspects of his holiness, his glory uh, manifest as holiness. In Luke chapter 2, verse 9, we read this. 9 verse, uh, 90 verse 14, we read this. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. We've just gone through this at Christmas, reminding us of it. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Christ, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find him being wrapped in clothes of, uh, uh, and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. How can it be that God would place his glory on the church and would be anything but attractive to a broken and dying world? How, how can it be that God would, would place his glory upon you and I and that when people look at us, they would see anything but something magnificent. You know, attractiveness is the means by which relationships are initiated. I mean, no, no, nobody's ever attracted to somebody they don't think is beautiful. You know, if you're a man and you see a, a young lady, if you're a young man, and you see a young lady, of course, you're too young, so um, you just wait a few more years, and you, see, and you see a young lady that you like, you, you're not attracted to somebody you don't think is attractive. You're attracted to somebody you think is beautiful. Attractiveness is the means by which relationships are initiated. And that's true in every context because it's a law in nature. It's a law that God has written into the fabric of space and time. So whether it's gravitational att attraction, you know, um, or, uh, uh, <laughs> or whether it's a, a b bees to a flower, you know, attractiveness is the means by which a relationship is initiated. And when you're attracted to something, whether it's heavenly bodies, the moon circling the earth, or the earth circling the sun, that attractiveness brings into it a relationship. And of course, Jesus wants the world to look at the church and to be attracted by what they see. You know, I mean, when people look at you, you know, they ought to see something in you that makes them think, why? Are they so happy? You know, why are they smiling all the time? I mean, have a look at your neighbor. This is gonna be, it's going to be hard not to smile now. But just have a look at your neighbor. And, uh, and, 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 and you see what I mean, how attractive they truly are. <laughs> you, know, you, know, you can't help smiling at that point, can you? you, know, you know, w w because this is what we're made like. We're made by God to be attractive. We're made by God to look good. We're made by God to stand out. So he places his glory upon us. You know, and so we understand it is so powerful. Yes, it, the glory of God can be terrifying, as when they saw his glory on the mountain, and the Israelites were terrified, afraid to come into the presence of God because his, his glory looked like a, a, a devouring fire. I mean, who wants, who, you know, who wants to step into what looks like a devouring fire? I mean, terrifying, terrifying. And, and, and so they said, okay, God, just, just speak to Moses. We'll hang back. We'll, we'll, we'll hang back here where it's safe. Moses, you and Joshua, you guys can go up the mountain. And uh, we, we'll just wait here for you to come back down again. And sometimes the holiness of God, the holiness of God convicts us so much so that we choose to live in mediocrity of Christianity rather than to press right in and be everything we could be in the presence of God. What is it that holds the church back? Sometimes the glory of God is so weighty. His presence is so full of conviction that we struggle to step into his presence. And so we choose a mediocre type of Christianity rather than one that's full of fire, full of life, full of God.
Oh, that the church in Caversham would be such a church. Come on, hear somebody say amen. amen. You know, I, thank, I knew my sister there was going to do that as loud as she could. Thank you, sister. You know, I mean, oh, that the church in Caversham would be such a church in Jesus' name. Can somebody say amen? amen. And so we have it that his glory is incredible. Uh, it's so powerful, you know, that when Saul persecuting the Christians, thinking he's doing God's will, okay, killing Christians, it's so, uh, uh, it, it, they came upon a time where Jesus kind of thinks, I've really got to stop this guy. But look at what he did. Look at how he did it. You know, Jesus appears to him. And what does he do? He falls off his horse. Many of us pray for an encounter with God. But I tell you this, if God turns up, some of you are going to fall off your horses. Some of your attitudes and your dispositions and the way you behave. If you truly have an encounter with Jesus, all oh, that we all would, all oh, that we all would fall off our horses. But if you truly have an encounter with Jesus, you're transformed in that instant. You're changed. Your behavior changes. Your lifestyle changes. And so when, when uh, uh, Paul, uh, Saul, I mean, <laughs> what was Saul? Saul was... Uh, well, you know, Saul in the Old Testament was head and shoulders above everybody else. It was a pride, wasn't it? And associated with that name. And, uh, you know, he renames himself. No longer is he head and shoulders. He calls himself Paul instead. He changes his name. And in that encounter, you know, you need to understand, the person that speaks most about grace eloquently in the Bible is Paul. Because he understood how terrible a person he was. How bad a person, killing Christians. And in that, what happened when he encountered Jesus, his whole life changed forever. His whole life changed. And so whenever you read Paul, you'll read about the grace, the amazing grace of God that saved him. Didn't consign him to condemnation. You don't have to live in guilt and condemnation. If you're not walking right with Jesus, you don't have to live on the edge of Christianity and dip your toes in and out. You can be transformed and changed so that your life is on fire for Jesus. So that you can stand in the glory like Moses stood in the glory. In fact, understand, you haven't got a choice. He's already put his glory on the church. The manifestation of it, though, is what we really need to see, is what the world really needs to see. And so, coming back to the glory, the manifestation of his glory, what, what actually is the intent uh, of God? Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 7, so we know he's placed his glory upon us. And there are certain benefits that come with having the glory of God upon the church. I mean, you know, <laughs> you know the incredible benefits that come with understanding. It said in the world that knowledge is power. Have you ever heard that phrase? Okay. Knowledge is power. Anybody here ever heard that phrase? If you heard that phrase, just nod your head, give me a wave. Uh, let's make sure we're not falling asleep. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and uh, knowledge is power. But you need to understand, it's also true spiritually. Spiritual knowledge is power. This is why Paul prays, I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened in order that you might know the hope to which is called you. Glorious inheritance for the saints. So Paul is praying for eyes to be opened. Why? Because, he under, because when you see who he truly is, what he's truly like, and what he's given, when you have that knowledge, nobody can take it from you. It's a bit like this. It's like, it's, it's like when you get born again. When you know that you're saved, Nobody can take it from you. You know you're saved. You know you're born again. Until that point in time, you'll keep on asking people to pray for you. I'd like to be saved. I want to be saved. How do, how do I become a Christian? How do I become born again? But the minute you're born again, you know you're saved. And nobody can take it from you. The devil comes along and tries to tell you, you're no good as a Christian. You just say, well, I'm saved by grace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know when you're saved. I was in Wales preaching once, uh, uh, and uh, 
There was an 80-something-year-old lady there, I think she was about 88, been to church all her life, and uh, everybody thought she was a Christian, but she'd never given her life to Christ. She'd believed it all, accepted it all, but she'd never asked forgiveness for her sins and giving her life to Jesus. The Bible is clear about this. You must repent of your sins and accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. Unless a man is born again, he shall not see the kingdom of heaven. And, and so she came at the end of the meeting and made an appeal for salvation. People responded to the altar call. They gave their lives to Christ. But she came at the end to me and she said, she said, Pastor, this is in Wales. I was planting a church in Wales, one of the church, churches. Of Wales. She came and said, Pastor, I, um, I, I, they all think I'm a Christian because I've been coming to this church for years. But I've never actually done it. So can you pray for me? I don't want them to hear. Can you just pray for me now quietly? So I kind of thought, yeah, I'm not going to embarrass her. She's 88 years old or whatever. Um, you know, elderly lady, let's just pray quietly, okay? We'll pray quietly. At least she's doing the right thing. She's making sure of her salvation. She's humbling herself before God. And so we prayed quietly there in this hall that we used to rent to do this out, these outreaches. We did outreaches every six weeks in that hall. And we saw over 100 people come to Christ uh, in about 18 months, something like that. Anyway, she, so she, she, she bowed her head, she prayed, give her life to Christ. And the minute she finished, you know what she did? She turned around, she, she, this woman would come kind of like embarrassed and shocked. She turned around, excuse me, everybody, you know, you all thought I was a Christian, but today I've given my life to Jesus. And the place erupted in applause as people were thrilled. I want to tell you what, you know, this is so important. Every time you see something good in your midst, give it a good clap, okay? Give it a good clap. Encourage those who are doing their best. You know, it's how God works. He encourages us. Anyway, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 7. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so the Old Testament, the law, nothing wrong with it. The law is pure, the law is perfect. The problem is you can't keep it, which is why Christ came. But it's a, it's a glorious ministry. Oh, there, there are things in it that we want to delve into, to dig into, to understand. Because knowledge is power. Spiritual knowledge is power. If you understand what the glory means for you personally, it's powerful. You'll change your expectations. It's, it's like when Fiona goes shopping and she comes back. My wife, Fiona, goes shopping and she comes back. My expectations are raised at what might be in the shopping basket. As the bags come out of the car, I run to help her. It's one of those times when she doesn't have to ask me twice. And as we unpack the bags, I'm looking, and the disappointment. When the goodies you're hoping for, especially the custard tarts, are not in there. If you, if you have the wrong expectations about what God has given the church, you will believe the wrong things. And if you believe the wrong things, it will result in disappointment in your life. You'll never achieve what actually God has for you because he doesn't impose knowledge on you. He asks you to study the scriptures and by so doing, gain understanding. So 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7. Now, if the ministry that brought... Death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory. <laughs> so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of his glory. Fading though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison was a surpassing glory. And if what was fading away came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while their radiance was fading away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read, it has not been removed. Because only in Christ is it taken away. 
Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is a spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is there is freedom. And we, verse 18, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Now, if I understand, and I know, that the glory of God is upon me, which means I've got to be good-looking, can I hear an amen? Amen. (laughs) Okay, so if, if, if the glory of God is upon you, which means you've got to be good-looking. If you're being transformed into the image of Christ, which means you're getting better looking every day, (laughs) then what does the world see? And, And so we understand, you see, God, Jesus wants people to be attractive to us because they see Christ in us. Because they see Jesus working in our lives. Not because we have great programs, but because we have great relationship with him. You know, God will bless any of your programs. It doesn't matter what program you try to use. He will bless it. Especially if you're the kind of church that seeks his face, that's desperate for his presence, that's allowing him to transform you inside out, that's allowing the Holy Spirit to convict you of your sin, deal with the stuff in your life. Has anybody here got stuff in their lives? Oh, Shaba, I I see your hand. And so we understand, you know, my hand is up as well, by the way. And so we understand that, we understand that this glory is something by which God wants to transform who and what we are. You don't have to be religious. You can be a Christian. You don't have to be a stick in the mud. Oh, no, they've moved the grand piano from the platform. (laughs) Oh, this is doom and gloom. (laughs) It used to look so nice up there. And now they're hiding it away as if they're embarrassed about it. You don't have to be that person that only ever sees problems. In fact, in my leadership team, you're not going to really last very long if you can't see solutions. Because every child of God is somebody who brings answers, not just problems. It's the enemy who always wants to accuse. But Jesus makes it clear. The scriptures make it clear. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God. Surely God has got a solution in our community by which whatever problem we face can be addressed. And as Baptists, because we believe in the priesthood of all believers, Every one of you should be able to bring solutions to the problems we face. Not just raise more problems as if you're the only one that can see problems. No, 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 no. Those who are intimate with Jesus, who are intimate with God, they don't just bring the problems. They bring the wisdom of God. Why? Because we have the mind of Christ. This is what we're looking for. We're looking for God to intervene. We're looking for God to solve our problems. We're looking for the glory. And of course... Gray hair is associated with a crown of glory. Anybody here got gray hair today? (laughs) I'm trying really hard, but it doesn't seem to be breaking through. So let me give you some of the benefits then as I wind up in what it means to be prodigious with glory. So the weight of heaven is upon us. The weight of God is upon the church. That means the church is beautiful. She's gorgeous. She's just amazing. And all she has to do is get herself well-dressed. When the church comes out, every head will turn because we carry the presence of Jesus with us. There's no such thing as an ugly church, just like there's no such thing as an ugly person. They're just ugly deeds. And so let me explain what the benefits are of this in closing so that you get a sense of perhaps some of the stuff you may be missing out on that you need to claim for yourself in your own life, in your own walk with Jesus. Turn to John chapter, this is perhaps one of the most significant ones. Uh, Turn to John chapter 15 and verse 8. I I live by this verse. You know, give an example. I do crazy things in my life 
And, you know, it, it, the minute I think I've heard God, and I, and, I, and I get it wrong, you know, please, you know, I'm not Prophet Moses. <laughs> um, you know, I do get it wrong. But as you walk with Jesus, what does Jesus promise? My sheep hear my voice. So as you practice to walk with Jesus, you get better at hearing what he's actually saying. It's a bit like being married, okay? You, you, you learn to listen to your wife if you've got any sense, okay? So if you have any sense, you learn to listen, okay? Not just nod and watch the television, but to actually engage. You know, when, when that, and when that TV goes off, for any reason, because there's a discussion to be had, you make sure you sit still and you look lovingly into her eyes and listen to everything she's got to say. Can I hear an amen? Okay. So in the same way, when we're, when we're talking about a relationship with God, Jesus' sheep know his voice. They hear his voice. I mean, I, let me get, I, I, just want, I just need to say this. A little bit of surgery, a little bit of distraction. I learned a long time ago that in marriage, that it's the duty of every husband, when there's a problem in the marriage, to initiate reconciliation first every time. Whether the wife was right or wrong. Whether the wife was at fault or not. It's the duty of the man to initiate reconciliation and ask for restoration of relationship every time. I taught this at a Bible college, and uh, the, the, there, was a, there was a married couple in Bible, there was Bible college, and like the, 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 the husband of this uh, young lad said, what? Where does, where does it say that in the Bible? <laughs> you know? and, uh, and I thought that was really funny. I said, okay, let, I'm going to help you, because you're looking a bit, a bit weird. Uh, I'm going to help you. Okay, so I said, let me help you. So I said, okay, you got your Bible? He said, yes, because we are students of the Word of God, are we not? Amen. So I said, um, the Bible says that whilst we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Is that correct? Is that correct? Okay, thank you. You know your Bible. And, and was that true when we were far away from God? Okay, okay. So, so whilst we were yet sinners, Christ chose to die for us even before we repented of our sins. He reached out to us to save us, to bring reconciliation between us and the Father. Are you with me so far? Is that, is that right? Okay, because once you get this revelation, there's no one getting it. And your wife will make good play of it from now on. Trust me. Okay. So, the Bible says, husbands, love your wives like... Shabbat. Get it? Okay. So, if Jesus initiates reconciliation first, a husband ought to be like Jesus. Always initiate reconciliation. Just nudge your husband and say, I hope you're listening, darling. Okay, so, if, so Ephesians chapter, uh, sorry, John chapter 15, verse 8. Now, I live by this. I hold on to this. I apply it in my life because I believe it's what Jesus said. Listen to this. This is to my Father's glory. To my Father's glory. That, in other words, that the glory that God has placed upon us, that God might be reflected back. Because the only thing God doesn't like is when we take the glory to ourselves. When we take the glory to come, look at how good I am at doing things, rather than reflecting it back to God. Look how amazing God is in providing me with these gifts and graces and abilities. That means I can do this. Oh, I've got a great dad. Look at all the gifts he's given me. And I can do that. Oh, I've got an amazing dad. Look at all these amazing talents he's given to me. When we saw the Chinese uh, 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 violin there just now, an amazing gift. Well, it's your father in heaven that wrote into your DNA the ability to do that. Those who are uh, uh, musically gifted and talented, or those who are mathematically, like our brother, <laughs> our brother Richard here. You know, anybody here loves mathematics? Well, there you go. You know, s s some of us don't have that brain. But, but listen, that's God that gave you. Why? Because you wrote into your DNA the ability to grasp and understand mathematics and the way you do. Whatever natural talent you have, that's God's blessing upon your life. So when and, and all of that ref, it should be offered back to God in praise and adoration and worship. We don't hold the glory to ourselves, but we acknowledge what he's done through us. And so we understand this then. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. A Christian's natural disposition 
walking in the glory that he's placed upon the church is to bear fruit. You can't help it. You're meant to be productive in your life, to be fruitful in your life. And the thing to understand, this is, this is supernatural spiritual knowledge we're talking about here. The thing to understand about this is if you imbibe it, hold it, accept it, the Bible says in Thessalonians, Paul says, I thank God because when you heard the word of God which you received from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as it actually is, the word of God which is at work in you who believe. In other words, if you believe what God has said and you imbibe it and dwell upon it, it, it becomes what? It becomes manifest in your life because you're holding on to truth, not a lie. If I said the building's on fire and you believed it, you'd all run out. Whether it's on fire or not, what you believe causes you to behave in particular ways. And so therefore it's important to know what you believe. Jesus said you're going to bear much fruit. What do you believe? Jesus said you're going to bear much fruit. What do you believe? That's just one. But let me say a few other ones. Um, you know, that God wants to strengthen you with his glorious riches. Ephesians 3 verse 16 that you have an inheritance, Ephesians 1 and verse 18, that there's glorious liberty, that the glory upon the church brings liberty to you and to me, the glorious liberty of the sons and daughters of God, Romans 8 verse 21, that there's a ministry in and working through you. If the glory of God is working in your life, if you're walking in unity with your brothers and sisters, that's where it best operates, then you're going to have extraordinary ministry. Whatever ministry God has given to you, it will be successful and be blessed in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. Um, uh, that, that, you, that you'll experience glorious power. Uh, uh, Colossians 1 verse 11, have a look at it. That the gospel itself is glorious, which we know and believe, and that we await the glorious appearing of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. When, when Jesus comes back again, it's going to be an amazing day. You know, I, I, whether we're in heaven with him already or whether we're waiting down here on earth when he arrives, it's going to be a glorious, glorious day glorious reunion. The reason why it's going to happen in the skies is because there's no football stadium big enough to hold us all. And so we'll all be meeting him as he comes and it will be an amazing moment for humanity. The glory of God is upon the church, but that glory is only manifest to the level to which we allow God to change us and transform us to which we allow him to change us into the likeness of Christ. Let's bow our head in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, this morning for your word into our hearts. Lord, we want to be those Christians that change the world. That's who you, you've made us to be. And Father, we ask this morning, Lord, forgive us where we've been slack in walking with you. Forgive us where, Father, we haven't been diligent with our faith. Forgive us, Lord, when, Lord, we've believed lies about ourselves. We're no good, we're useless, we're rubbish. Forgive us for believing lies. Forgive us for being contrary when we could bring hope and life and unity, solutions, not just point out the problems. Forgive us, Lord, when we've not believed that we're able to bring any kind of fruit, when all the time that's our destiny, according to your word. And so, Father, we thank you for Cavish and Baptist Church. We thank you it is growing in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, for what we see uh, what Pastor Colin has laid down, tram lines for the opportunity for growth to happen in this community. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for him. We thank you, Lord, for the youth band. That's just amazing. We thank you, Lord, for the fresh signs of life that we see. And we thank you, Lord, this hall is not going to be big enough to contain what you're going to do in all of our lives. Let your glory come. Let your glory descend. Let Christ be revealed. 